Well, good morning, everybody. Would you stand to your feet? We're gonna worship together this morning. It's so good to see your guys' faces. If you don't know me, my name's Morgan. This is Elisa, and this is Lane, and this is Brent on the keys, and we're just so excited to worship with you guys this morning. Um, isn't it so good that we can have a victory in Jesus no matter our situations, and we can have a hope in Him? So let's sing about that this morning.
I do have, uh, I told you in the snowstorm video slash sermon um, about our time ending at B4 and, um, and how the Lord had called us here um, permanent. And they threw me out like a dirty dog. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, Thursday night um, B4 church was so gracious, Pastor Brad, um, had Sharon and I come up and, and that's on tape if you want to watch it, but just a, a sending off. Thursday was my last day with uh, Beaverton Foursquare, B4 Church, uh, our last day. And they sent us here based on what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me and the Holy Spirit was speaking to Pastor Brad. And uh, we feel this is God's will. Uh, we are original... Um, uh, task was to come in an interim basis and, and, and be here. And it doesn't make any sense, but God said, you're going to be there and I'm calling you there. And so Sharon and I will be here for as long as God decides we're going to be here. I'll try to get a clip of that video, maybe send it out in the weekly, the weekly, uh, we call it the weekly bridge, or we could show it here. Um, so anyway, uh, you're stuck with me, like I told you in the videos. <laughs> Sharon told me uh, just before we found out uh, it was official, and, and Sharon said, well, they'll either be happy or run for the hills. So when I came in the next week, I was kind of looking at the hill. We don't have many hills around here, so I guess we're okay. Um, really, really do appreciate you guys. You have made us feel so welcome. This is our home. As I said on the tape, I don't know what made the editing, um, what went on the floor from our time Thursday night, but um, there's, a, there's an old saying of burning the, bridge, burning the boats, and that comes from the Viking days where they would come and, and they would say, we're going to conquer this land and we burn our boats because we're not going back. And that's the kind of commitment Sharon and I feel. This is where... We're called to be, this is where we'll be. It's not a temporary thing and then go back to before. This is our home. And yeah. so you're stuck with me, sorry about that. Today we're gonna to begin our, our look into uh, two letters that, that I really, really love. Um, and that is the two letters to Timothy. And so we're gonna begin a journey and I ask you to join us on that. Uh, it's going to be several parts. I won't even put a number on it. Uh, those of you that have been in small groups with me know that's a futile um, endeavor to try to put weeks on it. But um, whereas at times like today, 
we're going to study scripture by scripture, there will be sections where we'll look and get the main truths out of that, that section. And, and that is really our goal is to get the larger truths out of the, out of the lever, letters from Paul to Timothy and, and also see those not so obvious nuggets. And I think, I think we found one for today also on these pages. Now today, forgive me, but well, not really, but I say that anyway, uh, we're gonna set a lot of context today. We're gonna set the table, if you will, for our study, but we'll also get into the first two verses. Um, but uh, to me, context, uh, chronological and otherwise, is very, very important. Um, I, I, I love history. And, and I, love, I love history. When, when Sharon and I had the chance to go to Israel, um, it, it, was, it was wonderful. And, and look, I love jumping in with a group and talking theology all day long. I, let, let's talk about this and that. And, but I, I want something in my life, too, that's like real, something that's practical and usable and and so when, when, you know, I know if you were to guess what touched me the most about my time in Israel, our time in Israel might have been the tomb or the, the place of the skull or, or it could have been a bunch of other things. But for me, uh, under, I, I, we were standing on the Sea of Galilee or uh, Lake Gennesaret, whatever you want to call it, but the Sea of Galilee where they believed that Jesus after his resurrection was cooking fish and remember, the disciples were like, oh, I'm going fishing. And, and so they're out there. And, and what does he say? He says, hey, guys, throw it on the other side. And they're going, J Peter goes, it's Jesus, and jumps out of the boat. And then, of course, the boat gets back there. You know, that's Peter. But as, as I stood on, on that spot, the, the history of, of that, to, to know that somewhere in that area, our Lord stood and it was a devastated, crushed Peter that had betrayed his Lord, not once or twice, but three times. And, and to have Jesus cooking fish, which I don't know about you, I love that. Is that just me? Oh, I love that Jesus is cooking fish. And he says, Peter, do you love me? And, and we all know that conversation that happened. Well, that's kind of what I want us to get to. Let's understand the historical and chronological context of this letter and everything that's said. Now, we titled this series, In Case I Can't Be There. Now, um, I, I know for some of you that have been around for a while, that sounds a little bit familiar. Um, and yes, it is, because uh, Beaverton Four Square Church, Pastor Ron wrote a book with a similar title. And I'm sure the Mel family wouldn't come after me, but just in case, I changed it a little bit, um, in case I can't be there. Now, he wrote that in about 1999, and uh, Ron actually became our pastor when we moved to Beaverton uh, in 1991, um, until he went home to be with the Lord after a long battle with leukemia. Now, Ron, uh, Ron wrote this as a, actually a private book first to his son's Ron Jr. and Mark Mel. I got to know, I don't know Mark, but I know Ron very well. And um, there's probably at least one or two guys in the room that remember um, Ron from when he came to the Beaverton Police Department and became an officer. So got to know him a little bit. And it's so cool. Uh, let me tell you one story, okay? I, I know we don't have time for this, but I don't care. Um, so Ron, Ron Mel Jr. is getting sworn in. Um, as, a, as a, it was at the old city hall there on Griffith Drive. And so, and so Ron, uh, Pastor Ron, comes in and he's going to take pictures of the swearing and, and the pinning of the badge and all that stuff. And so Ron, of course, we, we didn't like spend a lot of time together, but we knew each other. And he said, I said, Ron, go, Pastor, I call him Pastor, go ahead, go ahead, get as close as you want to get. Don't worry about it. You're not going to disturb anything. And so there was a delay, as always is with most governmental things. And I'm sorry, did I say that? Um, but it was, we had a little bit of time to talk. And so he says, hey, Dan, now you, you picture Ron, long, lanky, you know, how he does this. And, and he goes, Dan, do you think I would have been a good police officer? I said, 
I said, Pastor, I love you so much, but you wouldn't have lasted a week. <laughs> the way you cuddle up to people and stuff. Anyway, um, so he writes this private books to his two sons because of his fight with leukemia. And he doesn't know whether he's going to be there or not. Now, he gives it to them on their high school graduation. And then he writes the book for the rest of us. Uh, but the letters to Paul and Timothy have, a, have a, a similar purpose with an additional emphasis uh, of insight into Timothy's assignment and call as a pastor. Now, having lived a few years, um, I find it particularly interesting to listen to the words of wise people for one reason or another realize that this may be their last time that they may speak to a person or a group. And for those of you watching online, today is February 28th, just to give you a time capsule. Uh, a lot of you know that Luis Palau, who's much loved and respected, uh, was diagnosed with cancer about three years ago. And it didn't look like, it, it looked very, very bad at the beginning. And, and yet the Lord gave him three years. Uh, if, if you don't know, uh, in January, he took a turn for the worst, and they're preparing for the inevitable at this point. But when he first got diagnosed, he was at B4 speaking to some area pastors. And I, I, I just, uh, based on what I just said, I went to that because I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear. Because I discovered that when somebody's in that type of setting speaking, that the unneeded, self-motivated, insecure, useless words are normally stripped away at that point. And you clearly see what's important in their lives, but also what they truly desire to pass on to people that love them, that, that they love and care for. So it is with Paul's letter to Timothy. The first letter was written in 64 AD. Now, that doesn't mean anything to most of us at this point, but I'll give you a little bit of context so it will make sense. He either wrote this letter that we're gonna to study today from either Rome or Macedonia, could be Philippi, but it's probably uh, Rome or Macedonia, just prior to his final imprisonment and ultimate death. So we can have a, a historical context as we read Acts 25 through 28. We see that his arrest that Paul then appeals to Caesar. And he was sent to Rome as a prisoner. Some scholars believe that he might have been released around 62 AD and was able to do uh, some traveling during that short period. I'm not sure. But during this period, whether he would have still been in custody or out for a short period of time, he writes the letter or the epistle that we study today. So let's get our bearings a little bit. Let's talk about Paul and his ministry and when he wrote what. And, uh, and if you're not a history buff, I apologize ahead of time, it'll move quick. But in his first missionary journey that was 46 to 48 AD, and that the narrative for that is found in Acts 13 and 14. Paul and Barnabas set sail with a young man named John Mark, uh, who was their helper. John Mark, for some reason, in the middle of the missionary journey, leaves them and heads home. So during his first missionary journey, Paul will write to the Galatian church, his first epistle. And of course, that will become the book of Galatians in the New Testament. On his second missionary journey, that was between 49 to 52 AD, and that is recorded in Acts 16 through 18. But we notice something for those of you that, that are not as familiar with the scriptures. He's not with Barnabas anymore. And the scriptures tell us that there was a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. And it's centered on the young man, John Mark, who deserted them during the first missionary journey. And Paul apparently was saying, there is no way we're taking this guy again. And Barnabas is saying, yes, we are. And they split. Now, can I say something about the Bible that I love and that is, it shows the good with the bad. If, if, if you've never watched a, a B4 sermon before, uh, watch, watch this weekend's because 
because Pastor Brad talked about the, the priest and how uh, Aaron and his sons were dressed and the reason for that. And then, at least in the Thursday night service, just exposed himself in the sense of just being, that's the whole thing in Leviticus about Aaron and his sons. And they are not like these mysterious priests in Egypt and other places you've been. They are just like you and me, but they're anointed to do a job. And then Brad talks about this. But I love how the scriptures give the good with the bad because you know what? Darn, not everything goes perfect. And sometimes we stumble and, and fail and it's good to know. So he now has a different uh, partner. His name is Silas. And so they first come to Derby, the Bible says, and then Lystra, which is a providence of Galatia. And this is why it's important because it is there that they will meet Timothy and invite him uh, to join on their journey with them. Now they'll go through several cities, including Ephesus, um, but while they're traveling from Providence to Providence on a second missionary journey, Paul will write First and Second Thessalonians. And the reason he had to write it is because of the persecution and he wouldn't be with them to walk them through some of the things um, that he needed to tell them. And I'm so thankful because in, in the letters to the Thessalonians, man, there is some great stuff there. Some really, really important stuff. So now we come to his third missionary journey that lasted from 53 to 57 AD, which is very, very important for our study. That can be found in Acts, and I can always put these down for you, or you can, you can Google them and get them, but Acts 18.23 through 21.14. Acts tells us that he spent a significant amount of the time on the third missionary journey in Ephesus, probably up to three years, which is not like Paul. Paul would plant a church, leave, leave it with the elders that are there, um, but we know Paul's time in Ephesus was very fruitful. Um, God graced them with many miracles, signs and wonders, and many people came to the faith in a very important city. Now, while in Ephesus on his third trip, Paul will write First and Second Corinthians, which you know was a very troubled church, and he's correcting some things that are going on, and that was written around 53 to 55 A.D., now, chronologically speaking, a very important gathering happens right now in relation to our letters. It is Paul saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. And we'll talk about that in weeks to come. It's a heartbreaking but very insightful meeting that happens. So in about 55 AD, Paul makes his way to Jerusalem. Um, while he's held over in, in Caesarea at Philip's house. And yes, it's the same Phyllis, Philip that we read about early in Acts. And you'll remember that it's mentioned that he has four daughters that move in the ministry of being prophets. So a, a prophet named Agabus will come up to Paul, and this is all in Acts 21.10, and say, and he'll literally come and take the rope or whatever it was that was holding his clothing on. It didn't fall off, but took it off. And he starts putting his arms like this and says this, you will be bound hand and foot by the Jews and given over to the Gentiles. Now, now the next observation really doesn't have a direct connection with our study. But if you really wanna know about Paul, you want to know what makes him tick. Listen to his response because the prophecy comes and the prophecy is true. The brothers and sisters begin to weep and they beg him, do not go to Jerusalem. Paul responds to them, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? He says, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus, verse 14, when he would not be dissuaded, we know Luke was writing this, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So he's transferred now in custody to Caesarea where he's imprisoned for two years from 58 to 60 AD. And Paul finally made it to Rome somewhere around 60 AD 
where he was under house arrest for two years. Now, although scholars disagree, as we said earlier, um, Paul may have been released for a couple of years, um, which would be called the fourth missionary journey, or he may have been kept in custody. It's not important. It's interesting how the church fights over stuff like this, and we don't have to. We really, really don't. There's so many things that divide us that I go, oh, who cares, right? What does it really matter? But he's, but whether, whichever that is, he's kept in, he's taken back into custody, what I call the fires of Rome in 64 AD, and, and history, not only biblical history, but but world history tells us that probably Nero set all these fires himself. And nevertheless, we know that during Paul's imprisonment that he will write several epistles or several letters that are known as the prison epistles. And that would be Ephesians and Philippians, Colossians, and one of my favorite little books, uh, Philemon. Uh, we also know that during this time that Nero, who was the emperor at the time, uh, just began a, a, a horrific campaign to wipe out Christianity. It, it was an unspeakable time of suffering for the church. Um, but it was his second letter to Timothy that was written a couple of years later, maybe 66 AD to 67 AD, somewhere around there, from prison in Rome, his final prison, just before he would be put to death. As far as we know, this was his last letter. Now, because of the, the lengthiness that we set, setting that context, hopefully that was helpful to at least two of you, uh, for our study, we will consider just two verses. So I'm gonna be reading out of 1 Timothy, uh, first chapter, verses one through two. It'll be up on the board. You can look or just listen. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we want to look at the apostle. He calls himself an apostle or one who is sent. And I debated this, this next five minutes so much, but I, I do, I, I really hear people get confused about gifts in the Bible. And, and can I, maybe for some of you don't need this, but some of you might, where it's just like, Dan, I don't get it. And let me, let me set a context of three different things. Won't take long, but, but listen in relation to what Paul said about an apostle. Ephesians 4.11 says this. He also gave apostles, prophets, uh, most say evangelists, uh, NIV says missionaries, same thing, as well as pastors and teachers as gifts to his church. Their purpose is to prepare God's people to serve and build up the body of Christ. So I know this can be confusing, so let me, just, let me just go a little bit further. So first, in Ephesians, we read about these gifts that are people that have been given to the church, and it lists them there very clearly, who and what they are. But secondly, he also has given gifts to all believers. And if you have chosen to follow Jesus, you have at least one gift, if not more, deposited in you by God. Romans 12 gives us a, a, a list. I don't think any of them are supposed to be exhaustive, but some of them are so practical. Some have the serving gift, the encouraging gift, the giving gift, uh, the lead or administrative type gift. There are some who have hospitality as something, and you know you have that gift or those gifts because your desires are driven by them a lot of times. Um, there, there are people sitting right here that it's not their only gifts, but they have the gift of hospitality. And, and it's just something they enjoy doing. And that's just an example of many of these Roman 12 gifts that, that is talked about. But we also have spiritual gifts available to help us minister to people especially in the letter to the Corinthians where Paul is trying to set things straight. He's saying, 
You have the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. And those things are supposed to function and help us minister. And we'll touch on that on another time. But those three main categories, if that helps at all, are the three main categories of gifts found in the scripture. Now, today, you, if you've been around at all, you know there's an abundance of resources that will help you figure out what your gift is. <laughs> Whether that's generally speaking or, or for his kingdom. And, and I, I'm a little bit humorous on that, but I know for some people that's very, very important. And I do not mean to be offensive at all, but you can get tested and you can read and study and talk to people and find out in, in my vocational life, which most of it was not in pastoring, um, has been personality tests and all the, I mean, how many have taken a personality test of some sort? Okay, for those of you online, just about everybody in the room. Uh, so listen, I, I have no problem with, with any of these, but if they are limiting you, if they are putting you in a box, if they're bringing confusion in your life, then, then put them on the back burner for a while. It, it, it cannot justify bad behavior. Listen, I knew a guy once, years ago now, and he won't be listening to this, you'll understand why. Um, but he said he was a prophet. And so his job, he felt, was to get everybody straightened out. You ever met that guy? <laughs> or someone like him? Here's the problem. He reasoned that he could be rude, because the prophets were rude, and he could just tear people to pieces with his words. And you know what he blamed it on? God has gifted me as a prophet. And we had a conversation. I'll leave it at that. So he won't be listening to this. Personally, as a young teenager, I, I felt a sense of call to be a pastor. And to be really, really honest with you, I didn't even know what that meant. Um, Sharon and I were on staff uh, while we are going to Bible college at, at La Puente Foursquare Church in, in SoCal. And, uh, and I knew I had a calling. I was in Bible college. And, and so you know what our job was? We cleaned up the church in the daycare. Yes, that was a development time. Um, but listen, I will never, ever in my entire life give in to this attitude of, don't you know I'm a pastor? No, I'm a servant. And all of us should feel that way. So these gifts in Ephesians 4, Jesus has given to the church is for a specific person. Peter puts it this way in chapter 4, verse 10. God has given gifts to each of you from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Manage them well so that God's generosity can flow through you. We all have gifts. God has given some of us multiple gifts, but there may be one that kind of drives you to where you find your satisfaction when you're doing it. Here's the point. Whatever your gift is, whether you're a gift to the body, whether the Spirit is giving you different gifts, or whether it's gifts that are helping you minister, they should all edify and build up the body of Christ. They are for the common good. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Anybody like my prophet friend that's bringing division, destruction, and hurt, that's not God. Very simple. Secondly, early in your walk with Jesus, or, or maybe you've never even thought about this and you've been with, walking with Jesus for a while, you may not know exactly what that gift is. Relax. Just serve right where you're at. When an opportunity arises, and it, it will become clear in time. So back to verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior in Christ Jesus, our hope. First of all, Paul was not flashing a title for self-gain, acknowledgement, or anything else. He was dealing 
with some very difficult issues, not only Ephesian church, for Pete's sakes, read the letters to the Corinthians. You got somebody sleeping with his mother for Pete's sakes and he's having to deal with, he goes, okay, remember when I told you to have supper together and then, and then do communion together? And then they were all, some were hogging the food, others were getting drunk and, and this was church in Corinth. And so Paul was just like, Paul was just like, oh my goodness, he needed to say, I am the apostle. Here's a key phrase, by the command of God. Now next week, we're gonna see that same Greek word, command, which is a military word, by the way, related to Timothy. So we'll discuss that next week, but it's very. But I wanted to make sure we had a good handle on what apostle was. So I go back a few hundred years and I was kind of looking as far back as Herodias, who, who was an ancient Greek historian about 500 years actually before Jesus was even born. And even then the word was used for an envoy or an ambassador who is sent out to represent his country and his king. Paul always regarded himself as an ambassador of Christ. You don't have to read very far to grab onto that. And listen, again, don't make an application only to the apostle. In truth, this is for all of us as believers. It's our first duty to be the ambassador of Christ, to represent our country, which is not here on this earth, our country and our king. We become a liaison. We become a representation. And that should shape your behavior to a certain extent. Even, even Jesus said, they're gonna, the world's going to know you by your love for one another. There's a represent and, and go through the church history, even the last couple hundred years, and you go, man, we fail there. But listen, we represent him. We are his ambassadors to those around us. So let's think about this for a second. On, on Paul being a spiritual father. And, and as I said, I, I love to get in discussions on, on theology and end times and all that kind of stuff, but I don't wanna get us to get so deep that we miss this beautiful relationship that's being laid out before us. Listen, Paul was a man who apparently had no children. And Timothy was a young man who had no spiritual father. Now he had a great mom and grandma that raised him in the faith, and we're gonna talk about that soon, but there was still a missing part in his life. So Paul says, Timothy, my true son in the faith. This is such a beautiful statement. One of the most interesting things that I've noticed in my walk with the Lord is that he will put us on assignment with people or things before we even know what's happening all out through our married life, Sharon and I um, have had the most awesome opportunities to influence, speak into, love, and walk with people and couples. Um, some for a short period of time, others for a lifetime. I'm a pastor. I know that now. I didn't even know what it meant a long time ago. I'm a shepherd, there's no doubt. Uh, I've had a couple of you confirm that here for me, thank you very much. Um, but I have done far more shepherding on the outside of the church than in the church building. There, there are many shepherds who will never do this vocationally, never, but are incredible shepherds in the neighborhoods and schools, businesses and first responders and hospital sports teams, disaster response teams, ministries like FCA and YWAM and and uh, Awana and all of the things that we're involved with, they're shepherding people. They're being that apostle, the one who sent, the one who's taking care of the sheep. Sometimes it's organic and sometimes it's community ministry leaders. Others are chaplains, which seem to be on the rise in the, in the kingdom. And one of the, probably one of the only few things I did good at the Beaver Police Department is put Jim McGuire as chaplain. Hey Jim, if you're watching this, I got you brother. Uh, Jim is a, a, an incredible man of God. I stole him from what was called Village Baptist at the time. I think they still hate me up there. Um, he was a pastor for like 30 years up there. 
And yeah, I stole him, I confess, I admit. Uh, but he has been the Beaverton police chaplain. Guys, how long has he been there now? 10 years maybe? Something like that. I don't even know. Um, but he's a chaplain. He's in a place, not in a church, but he's doing it outside of the church. Um, God is really doing something. And let me just say this very, very quickly. Now, but on the other side of COVID, I want us as a church to be led by the Spirit and don't become afraid of, of oh, wow, what's Pastor Dan going to do? Trust me. But we, we, have to, we have to be willing. We're in a post-Christian era right now, and we have to be willing to use new wineskins because you know what? God is doing something fresh and new. And after COVID, I just sense in my spirit that there is going to be things that we've never seen before. And he's going to give us ways of doing things that maybe we've never even thought of before. But we may need new wineskins. Um, and, and I'm so excited to see the people who call Bridgeport their home involved in some of those ministries that we were talking about. And, and I can see a day maybe when we even have a few chaplains here at Bridgeport who respond to hospitals and natural disasters and being shepherds in the city. But, but the question I want us to wrestle with this morning is in relation to our, te our text, do you have room for adoptive spiritual children in your life? And frankly, I don't care your age. I don't care whether you're married or single. Uh, um, do you have space? Do you have room in your life for spiritual children. And, and I got it, you guys. Sometimes it will depend on what season you're in. I understand that. And sometimes those will be very short term and sometimes they'll be more long term. This wonderful spirit, scriptural truth that we're looking at today is more than just about an apostle and a young pastor. God will bring people into your life. The question is, do you have space for them? Lastly, let's look at maybe what's a little nugget because he, he greets him and says, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a familiar greeting. You'll see it on all of Paul's letters to the different churches, but he also applied it to an individual, grace, mercy, peace, not only to the church but it's interesting because there's a difference. And the uniqueness is only in three letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, he will add to his greeting. He always greets grace and peace to you. And now he says, grace, mercy, and peace. Grace, we don't have time to go into, but chadas is the, is the Greek word a very familiar phrase for us, but it does, con it does convey a sense of favor, of God's undeserved favor. Now, the specific meaning of the Greek word depends on the context in which it's used. But here, I'm sure Paul's referring to the favor of God upon this young pastor, which he needed so badly at this, at this stage of his life where he had so much opposition. And know this, I'll give you insight is one of the things I prayed, and the, and the council knows this already, but one of the things I prayed, Lord, I don't know how long I get to do this, and I don't mean to cause insecurity on that. It's just, hey, I'm an old guy. Uh, I don't know how long I get to do this, but I don't want to make any huge mistakes, and I want to find favor with the people that you call to be here. And that's what he's asking for. He's saying, give him favor. Uh, the second is peace, has to do with wholeness, oneness, peace, quietness, rest. Several definition, uh, author Melissa Spolstra put it this way. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but an inner assurance of spiritual confidence and contentment. You're there, you're good, even in the midst of difficulty. But lastly, I want to look at this word mercy. In the Greek, it's elios, which means mercy, pity, and compassion. 
Timothy has a very difficult assignment. We're going to see in the next few weeks, it's incredible. He needed God's mercy. Don't you find the word, one of the main words for mercy is pity. Now, I, I don't know about you, maybe I've watched way too many movies, but the thing that comes to mind is something that I've seen in movies all the time. Don't you pity me. I don't want your pity, right? Am I the only one in the room? Okay, good, thank you. Um, but listen, the American dictionary, the English dictionary, says that pity is sympathetic sorrow for one's suffering or distressed. Pity's not a dirty word. It's not a bad word. You're not pathetic. Timothy needed this as he confronted false teachers, inner strife, conflict in the church, outside influences, many other things. And can I say this? He was alone without his spiritual father with him anymore. But I think the key to this is the Old Testament usage. The original word is chesed in the Old Testament for mercy. And it's used no fewer than 127 times in the Psalms. And here's the context. It means help in the time of need. It denotes God's active intervention to help. God's active to save. It may be that Paul added mercy to his two usual words, grace and peace, because Timothy was up against it. And Paul wanted to convey in one word that the Most High was there to help. I'm not going to be able to be there, but the Most High is. Would you stand with me? Father God, thank you for uh, opening up your word to us. We, we know that it's only by the Holy Spirit that we can even understand it. So we ask you to continue to open our eyes and our ears. We are open to what you teach us out of your word. And Father, I thank you for each and every one that is here, those that are watching online. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. Thank you that you've adopted us. And Lord, may we see those that we're supposed to take under our wings, Lord. And so um, it is our custom. Don't do it if you don't feel comfortable. It's just as we give the benediction, just open up your hands to what the Lord has for you. And may we be people who have time and space for those who God sovereignly puts in our lives. May we be people who will invest with those God causes to cross our paths, whether that is for a short or long season. And may we be people who move and speak in thoughtful wisdom with those we have influence with just in case we can't be there. And in the name of the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, may you be blessed with grace and mercy, and peace. Can you see it with an amen? amen? God bless you. Love you. We'll see you next week. Watch for the weekly bulletin coming out.